Hello and welcome to episode seven of the Truth Snack Podcast. In this episode, I'm doing something a little different. I'm sharing a sermon that I preached while back in Canada last September. The reason I'm sharing it on Truth Snack is because it's about a passage in scripture I wish every doubting Christian had a chance to reflect on. This story has helped me so much on my journey through doubt, and I think it could help you as well. So enjoy. Delighted, absolutely delighted to be here in person and to share from 1 Kings chapter 19. Yesterday I was with my brother-in-law and he said, oh, what are you preaching on tomorrow? I said, 1 Kings 19. He said, oh, you were assigned a passage? I said, no, actually I chose 1 Kings 19. (laughs) So excited uh, to be in this passage this morning and just my hope, my sincere hope from the bottom of my heart is that you just get exposed to it and through it, the living God. Uh, it's such a good story that if, if I just really get out of the way and you get to see what the text says, I think you'll be moved by it, and I think it'll touch your journey with God. And so um, what I've received from this story, I would like to pass on to you. And, uh, and that today is really going to be three, I think, poignant questions. And I'm going to put them to you, and then I'm going to let you and God talk it over later today. But I want to at least ask you those three questions. But before we do that, let's read the text itself. I think... Good, it's up there on the screen. This is 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 7. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some, baked, um, some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up, eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're going to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And then there came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're going to kill me too. Then the Lord said, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, and Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will, be, will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knee have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Okay. (laughs) Isn't that an incredible story? 
Whew, I just want to get out of the way. Um, there's so much in there that is so profound and so beautiful. And so, like I said, we're going to journey through three questions this morning. And here's the first. What if you don't have enough strength for the journey? What if you don't have enough strength for the journey? Elijah in this text, has just come off of Mount Carmel, that famous scene where he calls down the power of the Lord and fire from heaven. He's flying high, but not for long, because then there's a threat on his life and he believes it. Great triumph followed by great fear and more than just fear, exhaustion, depression, and even feelings of suicidality. Very high to very low. And it says in 1 Kings 19, 4, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. That's low. Twice the angel of the Lord comes to care for Elijah. Twice. And this is what happens. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him, said, get up and eat. This is what I don't want you to miss. For the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. So in Scotland, when we moved there, we needed to furnish our home a little bit. It came furnished, if you know what I mean. Um, so we had to go get a few more things to round out a living room, like a seat. And, uh, and on Facebook Marketplace, we found a really big, beautiful reclining chair for the living room. It was a couple miles away. They use miles over there. I don't know why. And so we were going to go get the chair and we had no vehicle to do that with. And, uh, and so I said, I don't know. We want this free chair. We got to get it back somewhere. You've seen Mel. Not going to be great help in carrying it. And so I'm like, well, how are we going to get this thing back? And so I decide, at best, we'll take a bicycle and we'll somehow try to get this thing on top of the bicycle and we'll kind of waddle down the pathways of Scotland until we get home. Now, I knew this was a bad plan. And I knew it was going to be incredibly hard, but we really had no other option, and we needed a chair. And when we arrived at the lady's house to pick up the chair, I said, oh, just pull your car around up front. I'm standing there with my bike. I'm like, no, we're here. <laughs> we got everything we have to get this thing home. And she's like, I'll go get my van. You don't worry. <sighs> Let me tell you, it's a great relief when your incapability is recognized by someone who is able to help. Amen? Amen? It's a great relief when your incapability is recognized by someone who is willing and able to help. That's what's going on in our story with Elijah here today. Home Depot's around. You can do it. We can help. And that gets into our system. We tend to think when it comes to the difficult parts of our lives that we can get through it. It'll be really hard. We can do it, but God could make it a little bit easier. We can do it. He can help. It sounds good. Unfortunately, the reality is sometimes that the, we don't have enough strength for the journey. So rather than it will be hard, but God can make it easier, sometimes the reality is it's impossible, but God can make it possible. That's what's happening with Elijah as he's encountering God. He's realizing that he can, does not have enough strength. He's down, way down. And God acknowledges that. He recognizes his incapability, and he's willing to help. Isn't that a wonderful moment? Some commentators on this passage, and many, many Old Testament theologians, believe this is what's called a Christophany. Christ, O-P-H-A-N-Y, Christophany. If you want to look it up, do some theological research this afternoon. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to love the Old Testament even more. What that means is that they actually think that this is an appearance of the Christ in the Old Testament. So let's roll with that for a second. Not everyone agrees with that, but I just want to roll with that because I think it's incredible. I want you to imagine Jesus showing up to Elijah and making him bread while he sleeps because he doesn't have what it takes to make it through the journey. So I just want to ask you, what if you don't have enough strength for the journey? Is there something in your life that right now Jesus is saying, you know what, you actually can't handle this and I need you to turn to me because I have bread from heaven that is going to sustain you on the journey ahead. What if you don't have enough strength for the journey? That's the first question. 
Here's the second question. What if you are like your ancestors? In 1 Kings 19, it says this. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, we've heard that, he came to the broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. What Elijah meant by that was, you've given me a ministry to tear down the altars of these false gods. Uh, Incomplete. I'm not done yet. In fact, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get it done. I might be killed before it's done. I'm a failure. And I'm kind of like my ancestors, the, the Israelites who came before me, incapable of keeping the influence of false gods out of our nation. So you know what? If I'm like them, maybe I should share the same fate as them. And it's time to take me because I've failed. He's on Jezebel's hit list, and that is coming through in the way that he's starting to think. He is depressed, and he's brought himself into the wilderness. But I think it's almost as if God sees what Elijah does, wanders into the wilderness, and God goes, oh, that's a good idea. Elijah, mm, you've given me something. So I think there's something here I want to do. And so God takes Elijah on a, uh, what's the word? For almost two years, I've been searching for a word, and I, I've, I haven't quite found it, I, I think until recently. I'm looking for a word that encapsulates a journey, but it's, it's not just a journey. It's not just about getting from A to B. It's about that journey sometimes being hard, <sighs> having uncertainty, dangers, fear, maybe some bad weather, maybe a trip and a fall at some times. But, but this is the thing about the journey is that those hard parts are, are part of the journey where you don't actually want to extract those difficult pieces. I've had such a hard time finding the word for that. And with my work with Truth Snack, I tried to kind of come up with a phrase that would kind of encapsulate this idea of a journey that's hard but worthwhile. And I came up with adventurous truth seeking. Because for doubters, I think that's what they need to do. They need to go on a journey of adventurous truth-seeking. And it's hard, and it's scary, and there's uncertainty and all of that. Thank goodness I moved to Scotland, because in Scotland, there are trail markers for lots of different footpaths and such, but there are also trail markers for pilgrimages. And finally, I realized that's the word. That's what I'm looking for. There's actually a word in our spiritual tradition for this idea, a pilgrimage. God takes Elijah on a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a transformative journey to a sacred center. If you're going to write something down today, that's a good one to write down. A pilgrimage is a transformative journey to a sacred center. And God is taking Elijah on, that's the word, a pilgrimage. So when Elijah gains his strength and he gets up, he wanders into the desert and he goes on a 40-day trip to Mount Horeb. You'll be disappointed to find out um, that the trip to Mount Horeb should only have taken 10 days. Uh, <laughs> I think that's hilarious because isn't that so God? I want to get there as quickly as possible. God's like, yeah, we're going to get there. It's going to take a little bit of time. You know, the trip is 10 days, but we're going to take 40 days. Um, did God get lost? No, I, I don't think so. Was God just being cruel to Elijah, making him wander in the wilderness? Mm, I don't think so. I think he was taking him on a pilgrimage where the difficulties were there for a purpose. Parker Palmer says this, in the tradition of pilgrimage, hardships are not seen as accidental, but as integral to the journey itself. Okay, this is what I think God is doing. He goes, oh, you want to wander into the wilderness? Wait a second. Yeah, I want you to see something here. I know we could get to Horeb in 10 days, but we're going to take 40 days because I want you, Elijah, to resonate with your ancestors who wandered this same wilderness for 40 years. I want you to take the journey you're on right now and I want you to map it onto their journey and see that there are some similarities in how they encountered me in the wilderness and I want you to encounter me in this wilderness too. And I think Elijah is smart enough to get it on day, you know, 27, right? He's like, okay, <laughs> we're still going on this journey as he wanders through the wilderness. The journey is longer than it needs to be so that Elijah resonates with his ancestors before him. Here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, we come from a spiritual family. We have a spiritual family tradition in which we encounter our God in long, on long journeys in the wilderness. Did you know that? 
That's the spiritual family you belong to. Jacob endured a wilderness journey. The nation of Israel endured a wilderness journey. We're learning about Elijah and his wilderness journey today. Christ himself endured a wilderness journey. We might all have a wilderness journey ahead of us. It's part of our family tradition. In Scotland, there are lots of beautiful hills to hike, and and that's basically what we do with our weekends, is we find a new hill to conquer. And there's one by our place, Lucklaw Hill. We can see it from our home, and it takes about an hour to walk from our home up to the top of the hill. And recently, Mel and I were walking there, and uh, while we were walking, I said, wouldn't it just be great if we could just teleport to the top of that hill? Because all we really want is the view, right? Like, that's what we're really aiming at here. Um, And so we keep kind of trudging down our farm roads, trying to get to the top of Lucklaw. And not five minutes later, we pass just piles of blackberry bushes on the side of the road that are filled with fruit. And we dig around in our bag and we find a plastic grocery bag and we start filling them up, right? And we had custard and blackberries that night and it was absolutely wonderful. And it wasn't missed on me that if we had teleported, we would have missed the blackberries. Sometimes there's something life-giving hidden along the way. And in the journeys that God takes us on, even the ones that are difficult, there's something life-giving hidden along the way. So I just want to ask you that question again. What if you are like your ancestors and God has something for you even on pilgrimages that he might bring you on? What if you are like your ancestors and there's something in that that will be life-giving for you. Here's our third and final question. What if God wants to meet you in a new way on the mountain? What if God wants to meet you in a new way on the mountain? Elijah comes to Horeb, and Horeb is another name for Sinai. We might know that mountain, and it's, well, it's the same mountain, but we might know that name uh, more intimately. So this is not the first time that the people of God have met God on this mountain. Here's another time in scripture, and I think this is the one that God is trying to bring to Elijah's mind because he's trying to get him to map his journey onto Israel's journey, how they met God at Sinai. So in Exodus 19, it says, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb. Mount Sinai was covered with with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up. From it, like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Elijah's just coming off of his encounter with God on Mount Carmel. He's used to this kind of encounter with God. The power, the energy, the fire, the trembling mountain, the the magnificent displays of God's omnipotence. And now Elijah's coming to another mountain where people have encountered God that same way on the mountain. And when he gets there, God asks him this, what are you doing here, Elijah? When I first read that, uh, I laughed out loud. If I was Elijah, I'd be like, what do you mean, what am I doing? You invited me here. You brought me here. What do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm asking you, what am I doing here? (laughs) You're the one who brought me through the desert for 40 days. Don't ask me what I'm doing here. Okay, okay. (laughs) I don't think God, God is initiating the lesson, you know? And so he asks Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah replies, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And Elijah starts to think, here come the fireworks. Here comes the fire and the trembling and the thunder and the power of God. But we see all those things. We see the wind and the earthquake and the fire. But God is not in those things. God comes in a gentle whisper. And that's new. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God asks again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Does this sound familiar? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one that left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Did you notice that Elijah said the exact same thing? 
So one commentator that I was reading this week said, uh, there's something helpful for Elijah in this question and answer process. That's commentator speak for I don't know what's going on here, okay? (laughs) So I feel a little at liberty to take my crack at it, and I'd like to share that with you. I think this is what the writer of this text is trying to show us. Elijah's circumstances and his desires haven't changed, even though he's encountered God. What has changed? I think his understanding of God, who God is. Elijah feels absolutely defeated. He's been on the mountaintop with the fire and the power, but now he's in a different place, and God comes to him differently. And I think God wants to say to him, I'm still with you even now, even when it feels like defeat. Father Timothy Gallagher says this. I think it's a good quote. God's loving providence does not include only half of our experiences Spiritual consolation, yes. Spiritual desolation, no. But rather is always active in our lives, both in giving us spiritual consolation and in permitting us to experience the trials of spiritual desolation. God wants to tell Elijah, yes, I'm with you on the mountaintop when I reveal myself in power, but I'm also the God who comes in a gentle whisper. The one who comes to you when you're weak. I'm the God of both of those moments. God's presence is in the power, the displays of power, but also in displays of gentleness, humility, and what we would say are foolishness, weakness. God is even there. A God on a cross, that kind of thinking. The greatest concern I had in putting together all of this sermon this morning was that somehow it would sound as though I'm being flippant about the difficult challenges we go through. As though I'm telling you to get over it, God's with you, stop complaining, it's not a big deal if you're suffering. I'm not saying any of that. The suffering we go through can be unbelievably uh, life-shaking. But I think God is asking us to trust him. A few years ago, I just want to share, I went through a time when I was uh, at probably the lowest point of my life. I was depressed, and if I'm being honest, I was struggling with suicidality, which is why I think this story just resonates with me so much. And I was telling a new friend about my story and what I was going through, and I was not completely healed on that journey yet. And my friend said to me, well, good. I don't really trust people who haven't suffered. Ooh. Well, I thought a lot of things, most of which are not sermon appropriate, if you know what I mean. It was hard to hear. And later I learned a lot more about this new friend, and I learned that they had suffered incredibly deeply in their life, and that it had transformed them. And I think what they were just trying to say was that you're going through something really hard, but you know what? It's also going to transform you, because God is with you. So I don't want to be flippant about pain or how difficult the pilgrimages are that God can ask us to go on. But he is asking us to trust him, to trust him. So what if God wants to meet you on the mountain in a new way? Here are our three questions today. What if you don't have the strength for the journey, but Jesus is willing to empower you? What if... You are like your ancestors, and there are things that God wants to teach you, even in the wildernesses of your life. And what if God wants to meet you in a new way on the mountain? It won't always immediately transform how you feel or what you want, but it can change everything. It does change everything when we have a deeper understanding of who our God truly is. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this beautiful text in which you show us your compassion for us and your willingness to make sense of the trials that we go through. Lord Jesus, I'll admit, I don't know how to make sense of my life and its suffering. I don't know how to make sense of scripture. I don't even know how to make sense of Jesus' own life unless the deaths that we encounter in life are paired with a coming and greater resurrection. It does not make sense without that hope. 
and yet we can place that hope in you. Jesus, will you transform us through an encounter with you through this text of your word? I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us on the Truth Snack Podcast. If you have something to add, don't be shy to reach out via social media or email me at matt at truthsnack.ca. If this podcast was helpful for you, please share it with someone you think it would benefit. And I'll see you next time.